this and that. D-Day, there were many D-Days during the war. Um, there was one in Italy, there was one in Sicily. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, even in, uh, on the islands when they were hit, sometimes they were called D-Days. But of course, the big one was, uh, was in Europe, the biggest, biggest amphibious landing in the history of the world. You know. I'll get to that in a minute, but a couple of the other uh, things that took place on this day. Uh, on June 6, 1586, Francis Drake's uh, men hit a did a raid on St. August Augustine in Spanish Florida, the oldest uh, town in what's now the United States of America. In uh, 1644, in China, the Qing Dynasty, uh, Manchu forces led by the emperor captured Beijing during the collapse of the Ming Dynasty. I was going to bring a piece of uh, currency uh, that I have. I don't know if I've shown that before. I'm going to have to go on safari to find it. But it's great. The, uh, the world's oldest known uh, currency was from the Ming Dynasty in the same year, 1644. And uh, a bunch of them were found. It was thought to have been destroyed, but uh, were found during the uh, uh, 1901. Revolution when the United States sent the military people over there to quell a rebellion. And a statue was knocked over, and a bunch of these, uh, um, a bunch of these uh, uh, pieces of currency were found under it. They thought they were all gone, but they were uh, they're quite large, like this, so a little bigger. Well, they had gigantic wallets, they were, uh, <laughs> and they had uh, pictures of, of uh, 300 coins or 500 coins. Uh, that were part of the block print on them, which is kind of interesting. In 1808, on this day, Napoleon's brother Joseph Bonaparte became the king of Spain. And in 1882, on this day, more than 100,000 people in Bombay, Italy, were killed when a cyclone ripped through the town. Another great disaster here in the United States in 1889 was the Great Seattle Fire, which uh, burned the whole downtown of Seattle. Um, Washington. 1918, during World War I, was the Battle of Bellu Woods, which, uh, if there hadn't been a D-Day, that would have been probably one of the things, big events. But it should have been. The United States Marine Corps suffered its worst single days casually while attempting to recapture uh, the wood at Chateau Pierre. 1918. 1933, the first drive-in theater opened in Camden, New Jersey. And in 1934, in the New Deal, uh, President FDR uh, signs the Securities Act of 1933, which uh, established the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. I had a run in with them once, so if you're a company I represent, you want to stay away from them if you can. Uh, and uh, in 19, everything ended okay. But in 1942, uh, on this day during uh, World War II, was the Battle of Midway. Uh, this was one of the turning points early in the Pacific War. Many of you may have read about the statue that's going up in uh, back east commemorating uh, the, uh, one of the uh, men that was in charge of attacking uh, the uh, Japanese Navy. We had almost no ships in our carriers, and that was about it. But uh, they couldn't find him at first, but eventually they were able to locate uh, the, uh, the uh, Japanese uh, convoy that included a destroyer. Uh, the destroyer was the uh, Mikuma, and they destroyed uh, that and four Japanese carriers, which really put the Japanese behind uh, for the very first time in the war and gave us a little bit of uh, time to catch our, our breath and build a navy after Pearl Harbor. Of course, on this day, 1944, was the Battle of Normandy uh, began. Um, yeah, I want to talk about that in a minute. And then, in 1946 on this date, the uh, Basketball Association of America formed, and that was the uh, NBA later. Um, in 1968 on this day, day, I'll never forget, was the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy, Democratic Party Senator from New York, brother of the 35th President. John F. Kennedy had also been assassinated. Uh, anyway, just a couple of events there that I want to discuss um, briefly. I was also on this date in 1985, to the grave of Wolfgang Gerhardt, that doesn't mean anything, is opened in uh, Embu, the Embu, Brazil. The exhumed remains are later proven to be those of Joseph Mengele, um, Auschwitz's angel of death. Mengele is thought to have drowned while swimming in February 1979. 
a broad manual of signature before, so I didn't bother today. 2005, in, guns, in the case of Gonzalez versus Rake, the United States Supreme Court uh, upheld a federal law banning cannabis, including medical marijuana. Okay, I think it changed in a few years. And in 2016, last year, major news outlets reported that Hillary Clinton uh, became the presumptive nominee for U.S. President, the first female in a majority party to do so in the country's 240-year history. Uh, and one of the things that, that also happened today was uh, great American patriot Patrick Henry passed away on this day back in uh, uh, 1799. I have a letter of Patrick Henry's that I've had for many years. Um, it's dated uh, just after the Constitutional Convention, October of 1787. Patrick Henry was chosen as a delegate. You all remember he was famous for saying, give me liberty or give me death during the Stamp Act uh, you know, fight uh, when uh, England was putting some, some big taxes on the colonists. Uh, we were also English at the time. And, uh, and about the time we started to revolt. But um, uh, he was later, as a patriot, was, uh, was one of the delegates to the Constitutional Convention of 1787, who refused to go because he smelled a rat, he said. Okay. And uh, he, didn't, uh, he was totally against federalism, or the states giving up their, uh, their independence. Uh, this was amazing that you know, we, we won our independence. We had 13 fighting, fighting nations, basically, or colonies. Uh, you can see the brilliance of Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, and uh, Adams, and these people that, uh, that brought, uh, brought the country together. It was really an almost impossible situation. And uh, good Lord's help on that, too, I know. Right, this is a letter from Patrick Henry to his son, basically saying, um, or just to his daughter, I'm sorry, this one's to his daughter, Ann. Um, written a month after he should have been at the Constitutional Convention, but refused to go, and saying, uh, why don't you write us a little more? We never hear from you. You know, that's basically what this is about. But uh, famous signature, P. Henry. It's interesting to me that many of the founding fathers of the country abbreviated their first names. And so uh, in the letters and things that I have, you've got like P. Henry, you've got T.H. Jefferson, G.E.O. Washington. <laughs> uh, John Adams sometimes spell out his name, sometimes just J. Adams. Uh, it's interesting how so many of them, I guess that was something uh, that they did quite regularly back then. Uh, another man that uh, uh, you know, was, uh, uh, died on this day was uh, J. Paul Getty, who at the time uh, he died as considered one of the wealthiest men in the world. I've got a check signed by him. And, uh, there's also a, a little letter. You have hmm? You haven't cashed it? No, I haven't cashed it. It's, <laughs> it's only for 10 bucks, and it's back in 1942. I think I paid more than four. Uh, at any rate, I've got a little letter that he wrote in 1964. It's just signed with his initials uh, to a friend in uh, Blankworth, Florida. Says, I'm afraid uh, I'm played out as a customer now. I've complete set of Henry or whatever. He says, I'm amused at the clipping you sent me. You are now having a visit from the Beatles, and I hope they escape the organ exterminator. <laughs> um, and then uh, Robert Kennedy. Uh, I had the opportunity of shaking Robert Kennedy's hand a month before he, month be, month or so before he died. He was here at uh, BYU and spoke, and I was a uh, political, uh, uh, you know, political science was my was my double major with history. And I always wanted to uh, to uh, get involved with uh, politics. I got a little taste of it early in my career after law school and decided uh, Harry Truman was right. You can't stand to get out of the kitchen, and I didn't like the heat or the kitchen, so I got out of it. But uh, <laughs> That, uh, you know, you have to have thicker skin than that. But I found out also that you can serve wherever you, you know, wherever you want to without having to run, without having to run pretty awesome. And so uh, service has been, has been uh, giving me a lot of opportunities to make up for that. But uh, I had a chance of uh, going to uh, a uh, seminar, uh, he, uh, not the devotional, but the other thing. What's it called? Where they have the speaker. The yeah, the forum. And, uh, and it was Senator Kennedy, and he was during his presidential campaign in 1968. And I get down to the, uh, the uh, uh, George Albert Smith Fieldhouse, which only held about what, 10 or 12,000 people at the most, and um, was designed by my great uncle Claude. 
Ashworth, should have been bigger, shouldn't have, but then we didn't know how big the school was going to become. And uh, it was packed, and all the doors were closed. I got there a little late from uh, class, and there were me and a couple other students. And, you know, here's, here's the biggest guy running for, for president, because Johnson decided not to run again. And, uh, and we can't get in to, to hear it. <laughs> so I back to the guy at the door, I says, can't you just kind of figure out, you know, we're political, in the political side, we got let out of class late, we'd sure love to, you know, get in there. And he said, well, there's no seats left. You know, everything's taken. And then finally, a few minutes before his talk, uh, one of the guys came out and said, well, I understand you're in a little political science class. And we said, yeah. He said, well, if you don't mind just sitting on the, on the basketball floor without a seat, that's fine. So we were sitting <laughs> five feet from the Senate as he spoke. They had the best seats in the entire house. And uh, when, it was, when it was over, I went up and shook his hand. Now, I, I missed out when John F. Kennedy came here in 63. My class, which was uh, the arts building next door, was gone. I uh, went up uh, together and got to see him. We had a, a church uh, function or something. We couldn't go. But uh, I did get to shake hands with Robert Kennedy. And what surprised me first about him was how short he was. He was, uh, that's the first time, first time I met Matt Redford. That surprised me on that too. So Robert Redford's not a really tall man. But, um, uh, but uh, Robert Kennedy was quite short compared to his brother in Valley. Um, but uh, you don't see that too often. And, a lot of the photos, but he was, uh, was a great man. I didn't agree with a lot of his political uh, leanings and positions, but uh, but he was one that really cared about uh, the poor and, and uh, uh, those that were downtrodden for a wealthy uh, Kennedy from uh, Hyannisport. That was an important uh, thing, I think, and uh, it was something that the country appreciated. Um, anyway, I, I brought today a couple of things. One, this is uh, this is a photo of his, uh, his and Ethel's large family, and a sign to their, uh, uh, to their uh, uh, nurse, I believe, that took care of, the, of their, uh, uh, yeah, Mary Mills. And it's uh, signed by him. If you look real close, you can see that little signature. And then there's a, this is an original photo that I got years ago of uh, John F. and Robert Kennedy uh, consulting in the White House. Certainly was uh, the president's closest advisor being his brother. Um, so it's kind of interesting. And then there's a, uh, there's a little letter I've got that I brought. I had other things, but they're just too big to bring. This is um, before the assassination of his brother. It's May 6, 1963 on the Attorney General Station here. And he's thanking someone. He says, many thanks for the nice letter you wrote. He says, the hike, me following the hike with our sons. They had already told me how much they enjoyed being with you, so I'm delighted this was a mutual feeling. It was good of you to write me, and as any parent would, I greatly appreciate your favorable remarks about the boys. Um, anyway, he was, uh, regardless of his politics or whether you don't agree with him or not, he was a good man. And, uh, and it was a terrible time when, uh, when he was also cut down. Uh, now, I had uh, watched his speech. My family had gone down to uh, Capistrano. They, uh, my mother tried to get a uh, beach house every couple year or so. And they were all gone, so I was the only one at home because I was working at Geneva. I was the oldest. And, uh, and so I watched Kennedy's uh, acceptance speech on winning the California primary, and then turned it off. <laughs> and it wasn't until the next day I realized he got shot right after, right after making that speech as he walked through the kitchen at the Ambassador Hotel in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, it was a sad day. Well, uh, the biggest thing to commemorate Today, I mentioned Midway, that was a great, great battle and so on, but I do have a few things from D Day. And um, a couple of things I wanted to just show you um, I think were uh, important. D Day was the largest amphibious landing in the history of the world. Approximately 160,000 uh, men were landed on, uh, uh, at uh, Normandy, there were five beaches at uh, Normandy. Um, uh, it was Utah. Uh, and Omaha, which were the two the Americans landed on. Omaha was the toughest of all five to take. They were all hard, but uh, it was the toughest by far. Almost lost Omaha. And uh, General Bradley, I, I about brought a letter of his, but he was, the GI General was about to uh, order the uh, um, evacuation of Omaha Beach and give up on that uh, beach. And Eisenhower had uh, written two Two letters. One I'm going to read just a little excerpt from to you. They read to the troops uh, as they took off from their their ships. 
You know, England had, uh, uh, there were 12 nations, not just the United States and Britain, that uh, attacked Normandy. There were 12, 12 allied nations that did. And um, Australia, Canada, uh, a number of countries even in, in uh, Africa and so on uh, that attacked. And uh, these, uh, so it was really a unified effort on behalf of the world to split uh, the Nazi forces. And it worked. It worked, thank heaven. Uh, there was a lot of debate as to whether it would or not. Uh, so Winston Churchill uh, told his wife Clementine when they went to bed the night before, because you all know that it was delayed one day, it was supposed to be June 5th, uh, but due to weather, and there was only one weatherman <laughs> was suggesting it might be better on the 6th. He was an English weatherman that, uh, that Eisenhower is head of the uh, Shafe, Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Command, um, Allied Expeditionary Forces. Uh, Listen to him. And he was one of the heroes of the war because the weather grew just enough that uh, we were able to get, uh, get those landings made. But even so, it was uh, such a tough uh, situation. Uh, it was such a tough situation to, uh, uh, to get uh, all of those men on the beaches and so on. And many of them, as you know, are, uh, a lot of the men didn't realize that it was actually a dry run for uh, uh, Operation Overlord. The over, overall operation was called that. And um, uh, there were uh, eight boats with, uh, uh, I think there was uh, over, well, they, they took off in April uh, just to, to do a, uh, a landing in England uh, as a uh, dry run. And the Germans got wind of that and sunk four of the boats and killed 800 Americans and British people for just making that landing in England. Uh, the American uh, intelligence, our intelligence, decided not to tell the other troops about that. And even the Paris didn't know they lost their 800 sons until after D-Day, two months later. They were so worried about the demoralization that would take, take place among the American uh, military and the, the British and the others uh, that they kept that a total secret of the huge loss of life in the dry run. Anyway, uh, it was, uh, first of all, there were paratroopers that hit right after midnight on the 6th of June. Uh, there were uh, 16,000 paratrooper troops, and uh, still the weather was so bad that uh, a lot of them couldn't see where the drop zone was, and that's why they had uh, the little clickers, you know, to uh, <laughs> where they were landing to make sure that, uh, you know, these were Americans who were coming on, not the Germans and so on. Um, and, uh, we know there were about 4,000 Americans that died uh, on D-Day there, uh, out of that group. Uh, there are over 10,000, or approximately 10,000 that are buried in the, the cemetery. And incidentally, that little piece of, of land has been deeded to the United States uh, where we could bury our dead on that, uh, on that, on that beach. Um, and at uh, any rate, we, uh, we lost uh, about 4,000 then, or about 10,000 from subsequent battles and so on, they're buried there at the beach and all that. How many of you had the opportunity of going to the cemetery? Normandy. It is a very impressive thing. Um, and uh, one of the impressive things about it is that uh, we had, uh, there are three Medal of Honor winners that are buried there. And uh, one of them is Theodore Roosevelt Jr. Teddy Roosevelt Jr. was a general. Uh, he was the, and the only general and the oldest man to attack a beach on D-Day. 56 years old. Uh, none of the generals went on the beaches, but he kept uh, putting in for uh, to go in on the, the landing at Utah Beach and uh, led our troops at Utah Beach. He had a heart attack within about a month, but his uh, daring uh, and bravery as uh, they were about to be overcome, the decisions he made there won that, won that beach for them, and he was given the Congressional Medal of Honor posthumously after he died of a heart attack about one month later. Now he's buried, uh, they, his uh, <coughs> brother, Quentin, was uh, killed as a flyer during World War I. These are two sons of Theodore Roosevelt. And uh, they reburied Quentin next to uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. So if you go to the, uh, Junior, so if you go to the American Cemetery, you'll see the two crosses next to each other, two World Wars, two brothers uh, who lost their lives. Uh, two great Americans. Um, and you'll see the graves of thousands of others that uh, gave their lives. The Jews have a Jewish star, uh, and the uh, Christians have a Christian cross on their uh, And the rows are beautiful. Um, 
it was an interesting experience, uh, though, when I first uh, went there. I've been there twice, and I went the second time with my wife, who's uh, father, my dad-in-law, Mike uh, Mills. I brought to Kiwanis once years ago. I don't know if any of you would have remembered that, but um, they were still around. But uh, he was on the second wave at uh, D-Day. Um, and uh, when I got there the first time, uh, I went there for the, for the uh, 50th anniversary originally, and then we went later for the, for the 60th. Um, and, uh, or 55th, I guess it was. And uh, when, I, when I first went, I took a train from um, uh, Paris, where they didn't really adore Americans all that much, as I recall, up to, uh, up to uh, the, the, uh, the station in, uh, uh, in uh, Normandy. And as I got off, I didn't know what I was going to do. I had uh, a little bit of my luggage and stuff. I've been all around. I've been on actually a tour of Israel and a few other places at the time for a company I worked for. So I had a lot of junk with me, a lot of souvenirs, you can imagine. Uh, and uh, anyway, this little French guy came, and a uh, little French man, he's probably in his early 40s. And he says, uh, he spoke in very broken English, but he says, I'll be back to pick you up. He was taking another family into their their uh, bed and breakfast or whatever for the night. And uh, he came back for me a few months later and, and took me in. And he said, uh, as we were discussing, we kind of became buddies all night real quick. And he said, you know, uh, all the years I've grown up here, and he said his grandfather was 97 at that time, uh, and owned a, sh a uh, fish fishing boat, which the uh, Nazis requisitioned uh, during the, uh, the takeover of France. And his uh, father always hated, his grandfather always hated the Nazis and taught his, uh, even his children, grandchildren, you know, about the horrible uh, situation under which they were forced to, to fish or to serve the, uh, the Nazis from the time of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, that the Nazis had control of France and, and Europe. And, um, and so that part of, uh, that part of France there, they, they still, still love us, you know, <laughs> around uh, Normandy. It's quite different, the feeling is quite different from, Way you you feel around some people in Paris as opposed to uh, the way you feel in Normandy, and um, I, but he told me he says in all the years I've grown up and all the years uh, I've heard these stories from my grandfather and my father who fought uh, resistance and so on. He said I've never met one single man who set foot on uh, D-Day <laughs> here, and I said well I think I can solve that, you know, and so I put in a call to to my father-in-law who's in. Uh, the Phoenix area, Tempe, Arizona at the time, before they moved up here. And uh, he was out for a walk with his dog. So I told a little French guy, I said, well, you know, uh, my mother-in-law said to uh, Margaret that the, the, he'll, he'll, uh, he'll be back in a few minutes, we'll call. Well, finally got the two of them on the phone. And it was the most interesting phone call, one of the most interesting phone calls I've ever listened in on. Because this little French man was asking all these questions because he'd taken people on tours and so on. He was asking to a, to a guy that was actually there. And uh, it was just fascinating to hear his response. I couldn't hear Mike's, uh, but I heard Mike's story many times. In fact, my wife liked it. I was the one that started to get him to talk. And that was true of a lot of uh, World War II people who didn't want to talk. Uh, and others of our veterans of other wars don't like talking about war. But uh, got him talking about it. And, uh, Anyway, he was so impressive on uh, D-Day, on June 6th of that year, he wrote a letter he wanted me to, to uh, take the mic, which I did, which meant a lot, a lot to him. Anyway, I just brought a couple of things. Uh, this is uh, from my father. He attended our, our Kiwanis, when it was down at the hotel. And uh, these are, this is a, a French award here. Well, he was probably recognized that day, but that's, a, that's the First Army <laughs> badge. And he was later, uh, he was in a gun battalion, but he was later uh, assigned uh, during the Battle of the Bulge uh, with, uh, uh, to uh, Patton's Third Army, as uh, Patton made the, the comment that we got to go save McAuliffe, you know, the general. The Bastogne uh, that was completely surrounded by the Nazis and told that he had one hour to survive to uh, surrender or uh, he'd be annihilated. <laughs> and you remember uh, uh, McAuliffe's famous response, one word, nuts. nuts. <laughs> and all of the, uh, all of the uh, translators in the German army trying to figure out what nuts meant. <laughs> and uh, Patton, when he heard the word, uh, they were quite a ways away with his tank corps and so on. Uh, they, they asked uh, both, the, both the British uh, and the American.
Americans. Anybody go up there and save him? Ben says, I can be there in two days. <laughs> so give, if you remember the movie with George C. Scott, you saw some of this. But said, uh, well, you, you ought to give yourself a little bit of, uh, a little bit of time. Daniel Smith was the next day. And, uh, and he said, no, any man that, that was that eloquent, we need to go save. <laughs> and so Ben went up there. You know, he had a horrible, horrible weather, too, and brought in his, uh, his chaplain uh, to ask for a weather prayer. I don't remember that part of the movie, but it actually took place. <laughs> and the chaplain uh, was kind of upset about the fact that, the, well, we should ask God to, <laughs> to give us good weather so we can kill, kill other humans you know, like this. He says, you just give me a good prayer. <laughs> and uh, I guess he did because they, the, the weather broke and Ben was able to save uh, uh, McCullough and Bastone. This is a picture of, uh, of my father-in-law. And finally, I just wanted to, uh, uh, what's that? What's that? Passed that. Oh, yeah, okay. That's the fourth round. Okay, please. Just don't drop this one. That doesn't belong to me. <laughs> <laughs> wipe those together. Actually, it's. Right, then. Let me just read this at the end here. I'll take a little extra time today. But um, uh, one of the books I came out with was Crusade in Europe by Dwight D. Eisenhower. And uh, there were a few copies of this where he actually signed. Uh, his uh, address on June 6, 44. Now he had two. He had two of them. He had a letter that he put away that he misdated July 6. <laughs> you know, I think he was nervous. <laughs> but in the letter, he took full responsibility for D-Day being a failure and having to pull our troops off the beaches and having to try to hit, hit the Atlantic Wall because Hitler made it almost impregnable for 2,400 miles, uh, but particularly right there in the right there on the shortest distance from uh, England. The actual shortest distance was at Calais, which is where the <laughs> Patton, with a whole army of uh, rubber tanks, you may recall that, uh, you know, to, uh, to try to think that the, uh, the Nazis would think, since we had our main general who was in the doghouse at the time, you recall, for slapping a couple of soldiers in North Africa. Uh, uh, they couldn't believe that we would have our main general, you know, with the place where we were going. So uh, even after, uh, even after, uh, D-Day, uh, Hitler and the, the Nazis still thought the Americans were going to hit them a, a second invasion at Calais, never happened. <laughs> by then we'd taken uh, northern France. Um, and, uh, but anyway, this is what Ike, uh, Ike wrote that was actually used, because uh, he said, Soldier, sailor, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you're about to embark upon the great crusade for which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. I'll let you read the rest of it. But I'll pass this around because I, I actually signed this, this copy. So that's the first he signed that. Hmm? Signed he actually signed this one. Yeah, it's wow. one, of the, one of the few he signed. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, I just want to, well, I wouldn't have a phone well, signature, you know. I've worked on that for years now. Please have <laughs> <one. laughs> But uh, I've taken too much time, but this is, a, this is an important day because uh, uh, due to D-Day and the Battle of Midway, I didn't spend a lot of time on, but uh, these were turning points uh, for the world on two fronts. And the great thing that D-Day did is it caused uh, Hitler to divide his forces, <laughs> and that's what we're looking for, you know. Uh, we attempted to get a, a start by hitting uh, Italy and Anzio and all those places, and we were, we had uh, terrible battles there, didn't get too far. Uh, a lot of us the way Italy laid out. Um, and it was rough fighting through Normandy because of all of the hedgerows and other things. But uh, uh, it caused Hitler to have to, to uh, leave his good troops down by Calais. <laughs> and uh, not to defend the Eastern Front. Uh, we're getting them up to uh, Normandy in time to, to defend the new Western Front. And led to, to uh, Hitler's demise a year, a year later, the downfall of Germany. The general who was in charge of the Nazi army at that time was at a birthday party because he figured the weather was so bad that nobody would ever try anything like that. Is that something that you remember as well? Yeah, it's true. And, and uh, you know, the, the Atlantic Walls was, um, Great German that Patton fought. Rommel. Rommel. Yeah. Got his signature before he got an old, sorry. 
Uh, and uh, and Rommel was uh, had, was forced to commit suicide before the battle because uh, Hitler thought he was involved with the um, with the uh, June June uh, you know who um, yeah the, right coup d'état yeah the coup d'état which is uh, von Stauffenberg von Stauffenberg left. Um, anyway, thanks for the time. It's an important day, and I think we need to think of uh, those that, that they gave the ultimate sacrifice. Um, if you were to have asked my father-in-law or my dad, who served all through uh, Pacific that I've talked about before, uh, who the heroes were, um, or uh, calling them heroes, they would have been disgusted if the heroes were their buddies that they left. But thanks. Okay, I guess I'm introducing Alex. I didn't realize I was going to do that today. Uh, Alex is a good friend of mine. Uh, we hired Alex actually out of the uh, Equal District. He committed our district, the Pro District, and, and be a principal for us, and he did a marvelous job. And then uh, and I retired, and Alex went into the district office because he, he's the assistant superintendent. Uh, it's not like the thing every now and then. He's old uh, elementary education in the district, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Well, thank you. Uh, it's kind of fun to think that this journey began a few years ago when, when I sat down with Bob and with the superintendent and said, you really want to hire me? <laughs> <laughs> and then they did. So it was great and I've enjoyed it. So hopefully today I'll give you a little bit of perspective on some, some things that we're doing in Provo School District. Um, kind of goes along with some of the conversations we've had in the past with Scott Snow, um, with ACES, with all those other things of how do we meet the needs of kids. Kids are not coming to us the way they came 10, 15, 20 years ago. A lot of kids that are coming to us have a lot of trauma, a lot of challenges that, that we didn't have to face as kids, you may not have had to face as kids, and your support systems were a little bit different. Now we're dealing with students that come from homes where most of the time they're, they're broke. We've got lots of traumatic things that have happened to them, dealing with alcohol, drugs, divorce, um, abuse, you name it, it's all there. I didn't break my ears, but you speak up a little bit or use the mic? Yeah. Is that, a, Alex, is part of that because some of them are refugees? Is that, have a, is that an aspect of it? I'll do my best to speak a little bit louder. Is that better? Absolutely. I'll do my best to speak louder. I don't know that it's because of refugees. I think it's the changing, dem changing demographics. Um, I work with um, a professor over at BYU for a while, um, and he did a study, The Tale of Three Cities in Provo City School District, um, where it talks about on this south, kind of right at the west side, there's kind of a low income movement there, then you've got the, the BYU college students that live right around in this area here that are in poverty, and then you have basically the East Bench that are your affluent areas. And so it basically talks about how the difference of the three cities has created quite the dynamic, complex intricacies within our own city, where it got real pockets of poverty over this way. And then we've got a lot of affluence up in this area. And then there's everything in between. So those three cities, is, it, it really creates some challenges there. So um, the, other, the other people I want to acknowledge and share with this is Lynette Christensen at BYU, as well as um, Richard Young. I don't know if you've had a chance to get to know those two. Those two are, are the experts um, in this area <coughs> in regards to um, working with kids that have real challenges or real struggles. So that's, that's kind of where it begins. Um, I also work with Paul Calderella. So this is BYU, and, and I work with them on a lot of these slides to put them together, so I've adapted them to make them a little bit more simple here, because a lot of this is deeper training that I do with our school districts. Um, but here's something I want to share with you, uh, just as, a, as something funny. The girl handed in the, uh, the drawing below uh, for a homework assignment. Oh, no. <laughs> <clears throat> Tell us the 
representation. I don't understand that exactly. So <laughs> 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 shovel. <laughs> successfully facing the challenges of life. Sounds pretty simple, right? So what happens when that child comes to school or they don't come to school at all? And if they come to school, their mom and dad had a fight the night before and they witnessed dad beating mom up. How much academic success are you going to get with that child in the classroom? Very much, right? Or if they didn't have breakfast. Or if they didn't have breakfast. Yeah, that's exactly our point. We, we've got a lot of poverty that's happening in our community. Um, so one of the things that this focuses on is positive behavior interventions and supports. Staying to the positive and saying, how do we meet the needs of kids where they're at? How do we get them the supports they need? So here's some studies that have been done that talks about a positive environment that makes a bigger difference than having a negative consequence driven environment where we're just going to be punitive towards kids. Okay? One of the other things I want to point out here is that they really talk a lot about the behavioral supports as well as defined explicitly and taught. How many of you guys, when you didn't know math, went home and mom and dad helped you get it? How many of you, when you were at school and didn't get it, somebody intervened with math? That was me. What do you do with behaviors? When they're not taught at home, somebody doesn't teach them to you, how do you know how to behave at school? Yeah, I heard something I rather remarkable on the radio last night when I was driving home. They were talking about a that in, I think it was in Detroit, that the school teacher principal created a gentleman's club in his school. Mm -hmm. And the kids learned how to be gentlemen. Well, it's not the kind of the other kind. Mm -hmm. And they learned how to be gentlemen, and they learned how to, how to lay a table, and how to take care of it, how to be, be considerate of women, and how to be, they were taught how to be gentlemen. And they had a little interview with one of the kids and he said, I used to I used to act up a lot. You know, and you tell he had an accent but kid, you know, kind of Detroit kind of. And he said, he said, I, I became I have joined the gentleman club. I don't do that anymore. I thought, wow, that's what we need to teach. Become a gentleman. But listen to what you just said. Somebody saw the vision of what it is that we need kids to be able to do and explicitly taught it in such a way that allowed them to be able to engage it. One of the challenges, Paul Tuff, if you haven't read any of his books, How Helping Children Succeed or How Children Succeed, is doing a lot of research on this. What happens with these kids when they are coming from the adverse childhood homes or adverse childhood experiences, the brain chemistry is actually changing. When we get into a fight or a flight situation, endorphins are released into our brain, right? And that changes the way we react to situations. What happens if that's how you live every single day? All that chemical endorphin that's pumped into your brain eventually is going to start to change the way your chemistry is. So when a kid comes to school and they only know a tough situation at home, when they come to an environment that's controlled, they don't know how to act. They don't have the skills, they don't have the background, they don't have the brain makeup to be able to do that. So this is where it's pushed a lot of this. So healthy school climates focus on both academic and social behaviors. If all we did is focus on the academic side of things, we're missing half of the child, especially in these current times. If you're living in the affluent side, 
you're most likely going to get some of that cultural, social skills that you need. But maybe you're, here. you're just hoping mom comes home that night. And you're hoping that when you get home, there will be food for you to eat with your little brother or sister. That's a total different thought than what I'm used to, than what I ever had to deal with. Okay? So, outcomes correlated with healthy schools. These are the things that will happen if we have these healthy school climates. They'll feel cared for, they'll feel safe in relationships. Um, they'll put more effort into the work. They'll improve reading, standardize test scores. Um, they promote social development, prevents behavior problems, reduces behavior problems, decreases discipline referrals and suspensions, lower absences, decreased delinquency. All these things are symptoms or basically outcomes of a healthy school climate. Okay? Effects of, on students' well-being. When a kid doesn't feel connected to somebody or an adult, where do they go? Say it again. Okay. If you don't think there's a problem in Purple School District, you are absolutely wrong in this state. I was at Centennial Middle School 11 years ago. 11 years ago. <laughs> I think it was 11 years ago. Oh, mom, so, uh, 11 years ago. And as an assistant principal, I dealt with more gang stuff there than I ever thought was ever possible in Provo, Utah. That was 11 years ago. It is barely a, an ounce of what's there now. Provo School District in Provo City area has gangs. Well, if they don't have a way to connect with somebody else, they're going to go right to the gangs because that's the only place they know to connect. In some cases, Alex, that's the only place that will accept them. Isn't that true? Yeah. They don't, people are, are put off by them, so they go somewhere where they feel accepted. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's where they're going to go. Yeah. I don't know whether it, you had a lot of experience with the proposed school or not, but the, a little bit. Stephen up there is the principal. Uh, I, it's absolutely remarkable. Discipline, courtesy, uh, a continuum of, of things that bring people together and make things happen. And he is number one in, the, if not the United States, and at least the, the state of Utah in terms of academics and um, breadth of, of character and everything else. Just amazing. Walk down the, the corridors of that school and there are signs that I have never seen before in a school. Um, what the underachiever does, what the achiever does, how he, how he runs his life. I'm, I'm, I'm a person who uh, I can get by these things, I can make them happen, and then just, the world owes me a living type thing. Right. And I'm going to MIT, I'm going to BYU, no excuses, and just everywhere you look, it's reinforcement, reinforcement, reinforcement of, of ideals and, and uh, positive uh, yeah. opportunity and so forth. I was just amazed, and he's got a musical group, which is a song, too. Goes back you, to what you, you just talked about, about, I'm sure. Clear expectations every child is going yeah. to college and creating those opportunities where kids can feel successful and connect. Yeah. So you're spot on. And Steve is doing some amazing things. Dr. Alderson is doing yeah. Positive behavior support will strengthen effective practices already occurring in school. So what Steve is already doing, Dr. O, adding some of these more component, these components that we'll talk about a little bit today, only helps and enhances what he's already doing. Because it doesn't lessen the expectation. It creates systems of support that's, that gives those kids the things that they wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah. Can I just add to that? Yes. Yeah. I had an opportunity with a, with a captive audience <laughs> when I was presenting with the awards. And I, I took a couple of minutes to tell them something. I told them that um, Mayor Billings told me once one the secret to success. I said, this is a secret, and I don't want you to tell anybody else, but it is the secret. How many of you would like to be successful? Yes, yes, yes. And I said, okay, can I use a four-letter word here, principal? Oh, yeah. And I wrote on the black, on the white word, K, R, O, and then I got a few responses, W, 
work. And that went the theme for the for that particular whole get together. Is not the fact that how you're going to be successful is work, work. It doesn't come to you, but you have to work at it. And ten thousand hours is not enough. He really, really enforces. I was just strictly impressed. I've been in their schools and so forth, and they do nice things there. But he is heads a part of what I've ever seen, ever. And what you're talking about there, too, is grit, resilience, and commitment to doing the, the hard stuff. And so that's that's also areas that we got to say, how are we going to get the next generation ready to do that? Yeah. What does grit look like in the 21st century? It may not be that you're swinging a, a shovel and a hammer and all those kind of things. It might look differently, but you still have to have it in order to get through it. So some of the things that we've done is we've, we've set the expectation in the district. Every school is expected to have a positive behavior intervention that supports system in their school. And every school is doing that. Now, it takes time and it takes effort to be able to get to that point. So what we've said is create a system of support. How they do it, each school will look a little bit different. Dr. Rose is going to look different than Wasatch. Wasatch is going to look different than Provo Peaks. But I can tell you I implemented this, and Bob can probably attest to this when I was hired. Provo Peaks was the old fair junior high. Oh, mercy. <laughs> I had no clue what I was getting into, and neither did I think they know to the extent that I was getting into this. When I sat down with the superintendent, he said, now you realize that this school has been failing for two years, right? I was like, not to that extent. The bottom of the list. And one of the things that I said to the superintendent at that time is I said that I need to create systems of support for kids. And I need to hire the right people to be able to do that. And fortunately, they were willing to work with me and help me do that. And we, I hired a young man named Giovanni Guzman, who's the principal there now. He has carried on the work that we started. But my first day on the job at that building, I spent probably 80 to 95 percent of my time dealing with fights, discipline, calling parents. That's all I did as a principal. Today, he gets maybe one or two office discipline referrals every three weeks. Yeah. Why? Because there's systems of support. That help. Let, let me emphasize, yeah. we were considering closing for Provo Peaks. When we were going to close the fair, we decided we were going to send the kids to Provo Peaks because it was a decreasing environment. Uh, the kids were leaving the environment, <laughs> a lot of them were So we said, well, let's just close it and send them over to Provo's. Wasatch. Let's just close this school. It's a failing school. Then we put you there. Now turn it around and map. And I wish I could say I could take credit for it. I, I don't. It was the team of people around me that allowed us to be able to pull that together and support us. So, and, and it created clear systems. Now, you may have heard these terms before. I want to share them with you. I don't want to go into detail with it. But each one of these acronyms, PLC, RTI, PDIS, and MTSS, are all saying the same thing. They're academic supports. But they usually don't focus on behavior until you get to the PBIS or the MTSS. Okay? So those of you that work with the schools, just be aware. Here's the here's what the what is positive behavior support is. students that honestly are going to come 
and sometimes they might have some real social emotional issues that have come with, their environment has imposed on them. They just don't know how to engage in a society normal. I get this all the time and throughout the year. And so those students at the top need intense intervention, which means you gotta bring your strongest, your most, most knowledgeable people together to say, I'm not the expert, but with all of us, we can be the expert. So one of the things that our schools have implemented is that they create at-risk teams. Every elementary principal has a team of teachers as well as social workers, psychologists, sometimes the police officers, sometimes an attendance uh, truancy officer. They sit down every week or every other week and they talk about their most at-risk kids. And with that, they start creating behavior plans. And they say, okay, if this kid needs this, what does it take for us to get him the supports they need to get to this level? Because if they can't function, there's no way you're going to get to the academic side of things. It just can't happen. So if a student doesn't address both the behavior and the academics, the kid continues to fall farther behind. They continue to be a behavior problem. And eventually what happens? Well, what happens to those kids? Kick them out. Kick them out or they drop out. Well, dropping out doesn't do us any good. Where do they go? Prison. Thank you. Or run the gangs. So we have to figure out how to meet the needs of kids. We can't just say, well, they're too hard around. We have to find systems of support. So the last three years, my push has been to create solid systems of support. At this level now, we have a district intervention team that work with, works with at the top of our top kids. And we're also working to create units that allow us to be able to say, how do we meet kids that are most so a school-wide behavior plan, these are the basic things you'll be looking for. We've kind, of, we've kind of talked about that a little bit. But here are the key elements that make it successful. The key one is at the top, why? If you don't have a principal that's invested in this 100%, invested in finding systems of support, it won't matter what you do, it'll eventually fall apart. Okay? Then you have to have systems to support professional development. What are you going to do to help everybody get on the same page? So that if our expectations are the same, we should teach it similarly so that the outcomes are the same. Yeah? Are the regimens then when kids go to college to become school teachers, is that something they get in college or is it something you have to pretty well teach them when they start working for you? Explain what you mean by regimen. Well, I mean this, they, they're trained to deal with these issues in college. Great. When I was in college, I didn't learn anything about management. On the job, really. So here's here's what I'll tell you. Uh, these these skills that you're you're pointing out to us, Alex. Are they do they do they have any of that when they come to start working? Not at the intense level that they need to be, and that's part of the challenge. Right now in Provo School District, we have an average of a 3.2 year expectancy of a teacher. The lifespan of a teacher. They're going to do something else after that. And the reason for it is what you just talked about. Will this increase in pay that you're now adopting elsewhere come here? Can you see that coming? Eventually, yes. Will that affect But your part of our challenge is we're a small district and we're landlocked. So a lot of the districts that are around us have growth money as well as they have um, other resources that they can tap into that have allowed them to be able to. So you don't see that coming readily? It will. It will? It will. Eventually, it will have to come this way because we're losing teachers too fast. Yeah. That's a real incentive. Right? It is, but if you're not supportive, if you don't have the support in the classroom and you don't really enjoy your job, how long will you stay? So that money is only one component of it. Really, we have to support teachers and help them to be able to do this. One of the things I've hired, you know Kathy Hansen. Oh, yes. So I've hired Kathy Hansen as a behavioral coach. She is one of the most phenomenal, just teacher-driven people there are. And one, one of the challenges is, is just like you said, they, they aren't coming out of school as prepared as they need to be. So when they get in the classroom and they've got five to 10 kids with aces, and they have no clue how to deal with them, that first year they're like, what am I doing? This money is not worth it. I'm not, I'm not like, they don't enjoy it. So yeah, right. Go someplace else, not only someplace else, but maybe more time. National statistics are five years, 50% of all teachers are gone in a five years period of time. Part of it's pay, a lot of it's this preparation, and it's hard work. 
it is hard work to manage 30 kids in a, in a room of age, for that fact, it doesn't matter. But it's hard work, and you've got to understand how to deal with it. It's hard work, but it's also very, very rewarding yes. when you know the systems and how to do it. So part of what we've done is to create a district-wide system of support that allows us to bring in coaches as well as at the school level systems of support. When they get to a point where I have a kid that's at the top of that tier, and they're like, all of my interventions haven't worked, let's go talk to a team and create some kind of a plan that will support this kid in my classroom so they're not falling further behind academically, but at the same time they're not disrupting it in such a way that I can not teach all the rest of the kids. One kid's tough. Five kids, that's a whole other world. Or ten kids, that's when it really starts to be a challenge. So that's why we've, we've created these targeted systems to be able to say, what are we going to do to better meet the needs of kids? Yeah. How well known is uh, Dr. Olverson? As far as he is nationally, the, no, I mean uh, here locally among the other principals and how he directs his program. I think they could be well schooled if they would take a day and find out how does he do it because he's a marvelous uh, instructor, a powerful person. We use him in our professional development, so he helps to they, facilitate some of that conversation. Yeah, I, I would hope so. so he's phenomenal. Yes, he's, 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 exactly, he's exceptional. So some of the core beliefs is every child learns and achieves at a high standard. So when you talk about that, our ultimate baseline that we have to be weary of is that end of year assessment, right? Because that's what the legislature sees, that's what everybody in the public sees. So we can't not have kids achieve at a high level because that's part of what we do. But in learning includes academic and social competency. We can have the brightest kid in the world, but if he doesn't know how to dialogue with the team, he's going to struggle. She's going to struggle. They have to be able to work together as a team. Right? And every leader, all levels, are responsible for every chapter. So this is where creating district level teams as well as school level teams makes a difference as well. So principles and practice. These are some of the basic things that I basically talked about here. So I'm just going to skip through through them. I want to talk about some of the basic dispositions that we need to have with students. If we can't have relationships with kids, I'm very clear that no kid's going to connect with you. They'll disconnect and find their own connection with games. So relationships with adults is one of the best things we do. So as we look at our group here, one of the things we also want to continue to, to do is look for ways that we can mentor and reach out to the kids. Relationships are the biggest thing that make all the difference in the world. It is the number one research over and over, proves it again and again. Relationships are the biggest key to helping kids be successful. Okay, rules and expectations. You got to get clear. What is it you want kids to be able to do, say, be? How do they act? Clarify that. Then routines and skills. So you got these clear expectations. How do you teach it? What are you going to do to ensure that those kids get the mastery? And then recognition and reinforcement. So Carol Dweck is right now part of the leading expert in uh, praise as well as with um, how you think and engage and be positive. Thinking. Praise is one of the most powerful tools we have, and we use it wrong. We praise achievement, not effort. When we praise achievement, we destroy the child. We have to praise effort. We have to praise what it is that we want kids to be able to do. I love, so for example, I love how hard you work that allowed you to be able to show what you know. Instead of saying, dang, you got 100%. You're smart. Do you see the difference in that? We praise the wrong way, and it's killing our kids. We have to praise effort and what we, what we see them doing, not just the end results. Because if we do, that's all they focus on. And as soon as something gets hard, we should. Okay. Um, review school discipline plans. So how do you work with kids that are really tough? What are you going to do? And then uh, reports and decisions. So everything's got to be database. Looking at data, where are the kids' most problems happening? Are they happening in one classroom? Are they happening in a specific area in the lunchroom? That's all part of that data decision making process. So, this is what that looks like. Do we have systems of support and what does the data look like? There are four basic components that we look at social competencies, supporting data decision making, supporting student behavior, and supporting staff behavior. Those four areas are what the, the inner workings are all about. If we can meet those four areas, you'll make it you'll get kids to be successful. Steve's a prime example. 
Geo is another one. Blocksite is doing some amazing things right now. Centennial, holy cow. I've seen them move in this last year. Their staff has been on board, and it's the staff that's leading the charge. It's not the one principal or the one person. The staff is leading. Over at Spring Creek, the coolest thing is kids were leading. They were invested in having the discussions around um, what rules were and expectations that should be happening in the school. They created the rules, created how to teach them. They walked, them, walked the kids through it, so when kids come in, they teach the kids that are new to the school how to do it. Pretty dang impressive. So it, it's cool to see that Steve's got one. There's multiple schools that are doing great things. That thing. So these are the, these are, this is how we make decision making, how it's done. What are you looking at? And I wanted to point out we talked about the 1 to 15%. But PBIS is about supporting the majority of kids. Do the whole school know how to function and live together at work? So you look at your street systems and how people drive on the roads. There's a, there's a system for how we engage in driving, right? Same thing happens in the school. If kids don't know how to engage and we don't teach them how to engage, pretty soon you have chaos. And kids will soon create their own systems of how they either control it or they disrupt it. Okay. So this is what it looks like. And if you'll notice, the system that 80% of kids, this preventative classroom instruction meets their needs. And you just have to be consistently reinforcing and positively teaching it over and over and over. On the other side here, you've got 15% or 5% that are in the tier two or the tier three that need extra support. So let me show you a graph of what this looks like. If we treat every kid equally the same, how does that work? <clears throat> Equity is teach, treating kids the way they need to be treated. So there's systems of support. So there is a continuation of, of what you teach consistently. The people, why? Because you do more for some kids than others? Uh -huh. I would think some parents would yep. whine about that. Absolutely. But hopefully it's not unreasonable. Most of what we do for kids is when they hit that extreme. And it's not really that overt, is it? No. Most of it's very covert. Yeah. Yeah. I believe in the Russian philosophy that if you say it loud enough, loud enough, long enough, and hard enough, it soon becomes the truth. And in Provost, they reimburse that everywhere you look in that school, on every wall, in every blank space that was a blank space, they've got all kinds of things that reinforce their acceptation of education and what it's all about in ways that I've never seen before. And it's constantly there. That's right, everywhere you go, you're looking at these things and it's it takes its, its effect. It isn't something that somebody just talked about once or yep. this is what the teacher said or something like that. It's repetitious. That's exactly my point. Is you get clear on what is it you want kids to do. So the school rules, the pro case, would be be responsible, be respectful, be safe. And that was reinforced over and over. Then you talk about how do you engage this? How do you teach this skill? And so this is what it looks like. You look at the teacher and you say, okay, you do it right away. Those are, the, those are the simple things that you do, but you have to be consistent in how you teach it throughout the whole school. So, there, I do have a video to show you, but I think we're going to run out of time. Um,
identifying issues and working through them and, and problem solving, you make a difference in the lives of kids. So there's a lot more research with this. There's a lot more stuff that I can share with you. Um, but overall, this is something that we're doing in Provo School District right now that's it's making a difference. And our neighboring districts are starting to watch and see what we're doing. This is, we're doing it district-wide, not just a pocket of school here. So, yeah. Having gone through Provost School once, they're going to destroy the school because it's going to be a new school. But before they do, I would invite every one of you to walk the halls just once and get an education of what a really prime school looks like and does to their students on a reinforced basis. It is strictly an education to walk down the halls. And it'll, it'll be open during the summertime off and on, I'm sure, but take the time to walk through the halls and you'll find what is being taught here in Provo City at a prime level. It's really very, very interesting. And that's where I would get to. Our Provo School District probably has, in the valley, the highest population of free readers fund students that attend our schools and probably the kids with the most aces. And because of that, we have some of the most challenging situations of keeping and retaining teachers as well as meeting the needs of kids. So Steve, Dr. Alderson is very good at being intentional. And this is what it basically boils down to. Can you get clear on what you want kids to be able to do and, and make sure that it's taught, reinforced, and supported throughout the school. As you do that, it changes behaviors, it changes kids, they come away excited. You get some of those experiences that we talked about it at Dr. O School, at Dr. O School, or over at Spring Creek, or at Provo Peaks, or, so there's lots of neat things like that happening. But anyway, any other questions for me? No, that doesn't sum up really well, because I kind of, well, thank you. Yeah.